Hello there, welcome to episode 56, 55, can't even remember what episode we're on now, of Fate of a Black Planet. I'm James Black. Um, what episode am I on now? Let me just check. Well, I hope you're all having a lovely beginning to the week. And try uh, episode 56 we're on now. Okay, cool. Plugging away, we're almost at 60. Um, yeah, I hope you're having a, a decent week. Um, the only thing I think to get through the this fucking bullshit time we're living in is to just shut it off, isn't it? I've been noticing that you, st- you use social media as entertainment. That's the, r- that's the worst thing, you see. That's when the manipulation starts. Um, it, but it, it's an understandable thing. It's not what I've been beating myself up about it. But I remember when I first started getting a computer, you know, with the old dial up modem, it was a real treat to get up in the morning, have a coffee, and just log on. And then you were suddenly connected to the world. Um, but I guess that w- the thing that we need to remember is that we can, um, we can connect to the world in different ways, you know. I mean, it's probably common sense, but for me it's, it's something I keep forgetting, you know. That there are other ways to get that feeling, and much better ways, in fact, to get that feeling than just sort of logging onto Twitter, because then you're sucked in. I find in myself I'm getting sucked into debates I don't really care about, or that I might care about, but the way that things are framed, there's there's no way for me to get involved other than in some h- horrible argument about something, you know. Um, a good example of that for me would be the whole gun debate in America. It's like I have my views on that, but none of them really fit tightly into into the debate of either pro gun or anti gun. I don't agree with all these people marching anti gun, but I don't agree with all these people saying, you know, there's no problem here. Stop persecuting us. It's our right. You know, I mean, I understand the the value of the Second Amendment. And so I think that there's something to be, to the, the intuitions need to be savoured and, and, and salvaged, um, while at the same time recognising that there's something fucked up going on. You know, it's like, but you can't have thoughts like that in the social media world. And I've been also another thing I've been beating myself up is, is there was a period where I was getting really angry and just, but from my point of view. When I was still on Facebook, the way I looked at it was this: I thought I felt like I was fighting a back at this constant pressure to have a, to think in a certain way. That's what was making me angry. And I think that's maybe what causes it. You log on to Twitter, and then su- suddenly, there's this torrent of of stuff that doesn't represent your view, and you see it in you know the, the whatever perspective you have, the subtleties of having a personal perspective, which we all have you know, the that gets swamped and you feel sort of intellectually and spiritually suffocated. So you either just log off or you fight back. So you're in a fight or flight kind of situation intellectually. When, you know, if you were having a glass of wine and discussing something with someone who had a different view, you would hash it out and maybe you would get uh, uppity, but you would you would have some kind of intuitive recourse to to understanding that this person is coming from somewhere legitimate rather than them just being part of a chorus and that's what it feels like so that's something I have to remember I have found myself getting really angry but (coughs) it comes from a good place my anger and I know that a lot of people don't believe that but whatever anger I feel and however obtuse I might come across sometimes um, for instance I would be prepared I, I think there there is a chorus of anti-gun rhetoric but it's very automatic and boring and it doesn't have anything to say apart from guns are bad man it's like the anti-war thing I find that suffocating but I also I'm not, but I'm not taken in by this uh, alt-right movement stuff either you know it's um all that stuff is 
some so I think there's some some genuinely sort of punky rebels on the right, and I think that's a good thing for society that suddenly sort of you don't have to be a socialist to be punk rock in a way. I think that's actually a good takeaway from the time we live in. But at the same time, I don't believe all a lot of these <coughs> right wing commentators, deep down right wing people, are authoritarian, and they, they they'll not admit it until you you know you're a couple of couple of hours into the discussion. But that's that's the way I look at it. And I'm my basic position is I'm anti authoritarian, and I don't care how moral you think you are. If you're preaching at me and telling me that I have to do something just cause in a kind of Ten Commandments kind of fashion. I'm going to fight back. But I realized that you can't make any headway on this because, I mean, the free speech stuff is a classic example. I, you, you don't fight hate by being authoritarian. You just, you feed it that way. That's the way I look at it and it's the way I'll always look at it. And I think that's a pretty reasoned and subtle way of looking at it. But in the... F- social media world that just comes out as he's defending nasty hateful people therefore you know it's like there's no way to express any subtlety around what i'm trying to say and it's so easy to be misrepresented it's suffocating and i really am having to be extremely disciplined not to go on social media too much and i'm just trying to use it for for promoting stuff And, and 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 if people want to engage me they can come here and engage me. Um, but I will not tolerate being straw manned and be, and having my views traduced to the lowest common denominator. So that if I'm defending, say, someone like Tommy Robinson's right to speak, that doesn't mean I defend everything he says. Or even if I, I but even if I say, actually, this guy needs to be listened to. So I think that's Tommy Robinson's a great example of free speech. If, if we don't listen to Tommy Robinson and what he's saying, and at least listen and try and really understand what he's saying in order to challenge it. If all we're going to do is, is virtue signal about how how he's terrible, racist, and blah, 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 without any evidence, then we're going to end up really confronted with racists. That's, the w- that's honestly the way I look at these things. But it seems like I can't make that, and I can feel the sort of choking frustration <laughs> coming up in me right now because I can feel that, that that can so quickly be misrepresented and I, I don't understand what's going on I don't understand the mechanics of it but it's something to do with some very primal shame mechanism in our evolutionary background and it just kicks in and I do think it gets manipulated by people but anyway so I'm, I'm trying not to to get involved in that but I am interested in engaging people and I am th- I'm still I've talked about it before I still consider getting like a separate email so if anybody does listen to this podcast and wants to rant at me they can do so but I will not be straw manned. It's insulting and it does make me angry. And that's where my rage comes from. Most of the time is the feeling that... I know, well, a good example is, is this uh, stuff bombing in Syria. Now, my initial intuitions are probably along with a lot of people these days. It's like, oh God, bad idea. Why the fuck are we going in here? It's none of our business. We're only going to make it worse. But there is often a humanitarian case to be made for intervention. You know, it's not decisive, and I think that's where the neocon types, they rely too much on that. It's n- There's never a decisive argument in intervention either way, is the way I look at it now, and it has to be a case-by-case basis. Um, but it's... <clears throat> so it's hard, and I don't know what I think about that particular case. But the feeling I get is 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 that there's this overwhelm there's this overwhelming well see that this is it the right wing are saying well the right wing and the left wing are pretty much on the same page on this which is funny but for different reasons um, they seem to be raging on the right about you know well they're mostly angry because Trump's betrayed his views on his proposals and in his campaign about being isolationist. So th- it comes from an isolationist point of view on the right. And then on the left, it's it's just this kind of Vietnam anti-war man. So you might agree with the result. I think 
I might come to the conclusion that I think, okay, uh, it's probably best that we leave this shit alone. But I don't agree, not for the same reasons that either of these position, these sort of polarized positions are, are saying that I should come to that conclusion for. It's, does that, am I communicating my, my frustration there? It's like, and so the, the, there's this, no matter what I say, there's this rage that comes out because you're not being understood, you're not being listened to. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's created this culture that even having conversations with people, they'll just be like, so what you're saying here is blah, 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 and they'll straw man you, and then they'll just kind of go off on the one rant about how great they are and virtue signal through their straw manning. You know, it's like... I try to think of things in a non-partisan way as much as possible these days. And I try to think on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, I don't know what the answer is with things like intervention. But, you know, it has to be a case-by-case -case basis. I think anybody who makes a rule one way, you know, from an isolationist right-wing point of view or from an anti-war Vietnam point of view. Not all wars are Vietnam and not all wars are the Second World War. All wars are different. All wars are horrifying, but all wars are different. And, uh, you know, to, to make to make kind of grand sweeping statements uh, before the fact and just kind of, you can't, you can't discuss things like intervention from purely abstract grounds. It has to be on the basis of what's going on on the actual ground. And I, for one, I don't know enough, but I know enough. What I do know is that it's fucking complicated. It's a huge proxy war for various competing interests, none of which are particularly good in and of themselves. They're all, they've all, they've all had recourse to evil, and they're they're n none of them are purely humanitarian, if any. So that's the way I look at it. But it just it, it's it it. I guess what I'm saying is that the, 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 the anger and frustration that I've vented on, on, on social media in the last couple of years, I think, has been due to the fact that you feel like your, your personality, and, and I'm sure anyone listening is, agrees with me on this, you feel like your personality is being swallowed and suffocated. And I, I, f I finally came to realize that no matter how hard I fight back, it just feeds the beast. You're just going to get more... It's a consensus machine, and the more you the more you insist on your own independence of mind, the more you'll be seen as a threat from all angles. Um, it's basically given right. It's a mob culture. So I don't know. It br it brings me to something I did want to talk about, which is um, just this d generally feeling that a kind of that that feeling of your personality being swallowed on on social media and it, it, it's part of a wider thing of a sort of fatalistic feeling that I've certainly had and I'm I can't be the only one particularly as an artist that there's no point in in even raising your voice or or making a contribution I've talked about it many times before and I'll talk about it again I'm sure in the future, but the Charlie Hebdo and Bataclan attacks were, m were for me what 9-11 must have been to people living in New York at the time. It was just an unthinkable proposition that people would be murdered for running a magazine, no matter what they say. It's just unthinkable. It's just so fundamental to my ideas about what culture is, what, what art is, what self-expression is, what civilization is, what Western democracy is, that it would be even possible for some, for a group of people in military uniform, highly armed, highly trained paramilitary operation to annihilate the editorial room of a magazine in Paris, France. And the same is true that the idea that people on a stage or enjoying music would be massacred at the hands of, again, highly trained, highly armed para paramilitary operatives. These were not 
the kinds of terrorists we see at the moment, which are generally kind of psycho drug addicts, porn freaks who have just, they've been, they're so gullible that they've, they've been persuaded to vent their psychotic rage in the name of an ideology that has nothing to do with their life at all, really. That's the way I look at a lot of these vehicle attacks or knife attacks or machete attacks that you see the sort of random lone wolf style. That was not what was going on in, in, in Paris um, on those in, in 2015. But the repercussions for that, I don't know, I was saying to my friend, it came out the wrong way the other day, I was saying, I felt traumatized since then. I've, I still feel traumatized since it sounds like a kind of, you know, oh, wow, it traumatized you, did it? Well, actually, people died. I get that, I get that. I'm not saying that my feelings are in any way significant, but I'm saying that from a personal point of view, I haven't, and, and for like just having living a meaningful life, and, and according to my life's purpose, it's been very difficult to really keep going in the face of the, f the brutal fact that that can now happen. And not only that, that some people were trying to explain it away from the left. That was the final straw for me with a lot of the, the hard left. Is that they were tr trying to say that, not that it was right, but that it, you know, that we should have seen it coming, that Charlie Hebdo doing cartoons of Muhammad was throwing oil on the fire, that the Bat Clan killings were a result of, you know, French foreign policy. It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, I, I, I was, I had all that shit. I used to think all that shit about 9 11. But I now can see that I was so addicted to my hatred of authority and what I considered to be the old grey man, George W. Bush you know, grey white guys lecturing from on high, that I failed to see that there were other forms of authoritarianism that were equally, if not more, dangerous. And that's the way I look at it now. So people explaining away what I consider to be completely unthinkable acts, which are antithetical to my idea of what liberty and freedom is, it really brought me back to John Stuart Mill. I mean, the... I am a million liberal and I'm very proud of it. And, and Charlie Hebdo brought me back to that. I remember reading John Stuart Mill. Well, I remember reading On Liberty for the first time and just racing through it and just being captivated by it and almost everything in it being speaking to my soul. And, you know, this basically the idea that we have to create a society in which individuals can flourish not in which individuals are, are nannied into a certain moral state, but that we create a level playing field in as much as possible in terms of opportunity in which individuals are free to reach their fullest potential. That's the intuition behind that view of liberty is, is, the, way I, is the way I'm seeing it. So um, yeah, I just feel that that's no longer a given in, in, in a way that I thought it was when I was growing up, and it's just shocking to me. And maybe that's also just a part of growing up that you realize things are not so much of a given as you thought they were and hoped they would be. And for the very people who I thought were on my side, the left, the sort of anti-authoritarian, or what I thought was anti-authoritarian left, for people to be starting to explain away and, and sort of um, shield culpability for what I consider to be just outright fascism. Um, it's just, it's unthinkable to me. So that it, it just, it's very difficult to maintain a sense of free expression and creative integrity in the face of the fact that physical backlash is now a normal thing. Does that make sense? So I did do an EP and it's up on SoundCloud called the ISIS EP, which was uh, finally got round to recording last year some songs which really came out of the Bath Clan killing, I think. And that they came in very it was it was like one of those stories you hear, you know, they really came at a very in a very short period of time and they came very much fully formed, really, and um but they were very much I from my point of view, they would be considered and this is the thing, again, it goes back to that Twitter mob being misrepresented, being straw man. From my point of view, this was obvious liberal sort of 1960s civil rights perspective on what had happened. But it would be seen as an alt-right 
uh, antagonism of Islam. And that it's very frustrating because it's got nothing to do with individual Muslim people. It's, it's to do with what I consider to be a fascist ideology, which has now made it normal to expect repercussions for certain creative acts. That's just untenable in a democracy. It's just, and it's untenable to a bohemian way of life. To to to, it it to me it's a it's a rever it's a a regression to the very same kind of nastiness that sent Oscar Wilde to the treadmill for two years and eventually killed him just for being gay. Just uh, but but it was more than that for being an artist who was willing to challenge the 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 sort of um, the hip the hypocritical assumptions of the age. It's the same thing for me, and for it now, to, it's almost just it's been passed over as just acceptable that that might be the case, that that might happen, and also that if you are in any way unhappy with that, then you must have some kind of alt right agenda. I mean, it's just. It, it makes my head want to explode that anyone would think that. And I'm really trying to keep my temper around this and say it in a calm, reasoned way because it's coming from what I consider to be my deeply felt connection to the Martin Luther King, Phil Oaks, Woody Guthrie tradition of, of the individual voice. So it's... Um, it just boggles the mind that I'm ha even having to have this discussion now. And, and, and <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, that's, that's one of the main reasons it's just so hard to be an artist now, to go out on the street and to say, sing your voice, because you might say something that pisses someone off so much that you're, you, know, you could face f genuine physical backlash. You can't go where your creative muse might want you to go. And I've had this experience from writing those songs. They're pretty hardcore songs, but they're songs. That's what they're meant to do. As an artist, you're not meant to just sit around, you know, back slapping everybody and go, yeah, aren't we cool and cool people just jamming? No, it's about fucking saying the unsayable and pushing the boundaries of what can be said and what can be thought in order to grow, in order to evolve past whatever might be holding us back. And I take Oscar Wilde as the model for that. <sighs> but it now seems we're, we're you know, but it, but the people who would explain away that kind of thing would think of themselves as the rebels, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But another thing is that even if you don't get physically attacked, you do, and you know, if you if you say 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 I wa say this podcast was to suddenly take off, I would never be in a situation where I would be constantly firefighting online about what I'm saying here, constantly having to go over what I've just said in order to hash out because people would people use misunderstandings and misinterpreting. You look at the Vox headlines and the Huffington Post headlines, these snappy social media headlines. And by the way, I do this for a living. I write those kind of fucking headlines for a living. So I know the sneaky fucking tactics involved there. I do that for a living. I edit these things. I know this fucking industry. So don't fucking tell me I don't. I know what I'm talking about here. It's manipulative and it's snide and there's a fucking nihilistic core to it. But I'm a fucking beast in the machine. I'm a beast in the machine. And I'm going to rip it down. And by rip it down, I don't mean civilization. I don't mean the constitution. I don't mean all the beautiful things about living in a free society. I mean nihilism. I mean, I'm in the nihilist machine, but I'm nowhere. There's no way... There's no, these people have, these nihilists have created a monster in me, a romantic monster, a Keatsian monster. I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm going to keep subverting it from inside, subverting nihilism with beauty, with idealism, with romance. But even if I, even if you, this is another thing, this is the thing I'm trying to say. If if you are successful, even if you are quote unquote successful or in some way make it, it's so it's so impossible to be really 
to really make a connection with your audience. And it's so easy for people to misrepresent you that you're either going to spend so much of your time firefighting deliberate misinterpretations and manipulations of what you're saying, or you're just not going to make any connection at all. So are you, are you going to just become a kind of bland, numb wallpaper music like everyone else in order to just make money and get by? So that's another thing. And you just think, well, do I really want that? Do I want to have, do I want to live with just the, the, the stark choice between exhausting controversy, which will kill you eventually anyway? I mean, that, it, kill, it kills people. It's exactly what killed Lenny Bruce. And it's funny, isn't it? It's funny that these people who are supposed to be the lefties, who are supposed to be the counterculture, are actually the new orthodoxy. They're, they're the ones behaving like this, the, the judges who effectively killed Lenny Bruce, or who locked up Oscar Wilde, or who I think eventually caused the death of Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison is another example. He was worn down. You know? These people, the same, the new, count the counterculture has become the new dictatorship. And that's why I take my stance on certain things, because Bob Dylan's got a great song called Sometimes Satan comes as a man of peace, and I really believe that. That's that's how I think of the so-called counterculture or the, the liberal consensus of the day. The Brexit's a great example for that. A lot of people who thought that they were fighting for human rights and, and unity and global peace were actually fighting for a globalist technocr technocracy, which was pure vested interest, which was the same ideology that led to the crash in 2008, which was about being above the law it was manipulative, and it was also homogenous, blandifying, making everything monotonous and the same, and 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 and, wear, and and wearing away all texture to life, and all beauty, and all uniqueness to place. But it all, but you, but but the the propaganda, it's like that line from Apocalypse Now: the bullshit piles up so high, you know. There's, it, the bullshit is so high that to wade through it's almost impossible. So that also just makes you not want to get up in the morning as an artist and not bother. You know, the bullshit level is so high. The propaganda, they'll twist your words, they'll turn it around. They'll, the, the, what's, what's called human rights and freedom is actually technocracy and manipulation and propaganda. And so it's almost impossible to fight against it because if you try and fight against it, you're automatically some some right wing loon or or, or, or anti freedom. When in actual fact, you're maybe the one that's pro freedom. And then the people who are really anti freedom, you can't tell the difference. <laughs> so it's like it, everything goes to hell. And you know why? Why would an artist even want to? And the thing is, is that not all art is about being controversial, but you have to have that ability. You have, it's about having the sort of spiritual potential to go to places. And if you don't have that as an artist, if you don't have that ability to be completely open to saying the unsayable, then you can't get even the most contemplative, lyrical, peaceful art. Because the whole point in being an artist is being completely open and allowing it to come to you. And a political correct culture doesn't allow for that. It's oppressive. It's oppressive, and I'm not. And I. And this is not speculative. This is this is this is fact about my life. It is just difficult to get up in the morning in the face of political correctness. And there's nothing right and high moral about it. There is nothing right and high moral about political correctness. There is nothing high and right and moral about it. There's nothing. 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 If you believe in the potential and the flourishing of each individual human person capable of their own dignity, then you don't believe in political correctness because you don't believe that you can force that. You know, you, you, you believe in laying the groundwork for allowing that flourishing to come through. So if there is hate out there, you create a society in which 
every individual has the tools in which they can challenge that hate. That's free speech. You, you basically have to avoid any situation where anyone can have a monopoly on speech. And that is why I'm against authoritarianism about speech. It's not because I'm defending anyone. It's because if you, the minute you create any kind of monopoly, whether you, no matter how high-minded you think it is, once you create, a, especially a government monopoly or a, or a corporate monopoly, which is like Twitter, as soon as you allow that monopoly of speech to happen, all it takes is for a slight shift in that power structure and suddenly you've got someone you really don't want with a hell of a lot of power over what is said and what isn't. So it is the monopoly on speech that I'm against. And I believe that political correctness actually veers towards a monopoly on speech uh, rather than actually a diversity of speech. And that's why. There you go. There's my argument. But my point about this is just that as well as the physical backlash, there's also just this, this, this intellectual and spiritual backlash that comes from the mob culture that we live in, this media, social media consensus-driven monopoly on what is right and what is wrong, a monopoly on, on, on moral thinking, which is totalitarian. I mean, it's a, it's a key aspect of totalitarianism, and it can become outright totalitarianism very quickly. So yeah, I'm against it, and yet yeah, it's impossible to be a, a, an artist of any integrity in that world. That's the way I look at it. But the, uh, uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about on this topic, oh, you know, the, these are things that have just been making it hard for me to get up in the morning and, and continue to be an artist and develop my craft and just have any kind of hope for the future about what I'm doing. And I'm sure a lot of people in the in the creative world agree. But there's another thing, it's just like, because there's so much bullshit out there, do you, re do, do, it's almost like the only, the only sensible option is to say nothing at all. And that in itself is, is difficult for an artist, you know, it's like, do I really want to write another song? Do I really want to, on a podcast, does the world really need another commentator? You know, so that's, you know, just in terms of the sheer noise, the sh you know, the, even if you're saying something sensible, because the, 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 the bullshit is so intense, you're just, in, you're just feeding it. So even dissenting opinions become the engine of the consensus. I mean, that's, that's really what the Huffington Post is all about. That's re it's really what the media is all about, is it? The pretense of having a broad church of opinion is really just to reinforce the dominant consensus of whatever organization happens to be, you know. So, those are the things that it's just, it's been like, it's been two years really, I mean it's been since, yeah, I mean maybe no, two and a half years since, since um, the, the, those attacks in 2015 these factors, not just the physical backlash, but the, the sort of cultural backlash and the cultural noise and bullshit, all of that has contributed just to like, why do I even bother? I mean, the idea of actually becoming successful in this world is, is horrifying. You know, even if all my dreams came true, it would be an intense hell, <laughs> you know? So why would I want to do that? And so now I've just realized, I'm just going to do these podcasts, I'm just going to busk on the street, and play my songs, I'm going to write my blog. I'm going to, and I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to ignore you, your cynical bastards out there who are thinking, oh, you know, the only thing that you think is intelligent is some reductive psychological template on which you're putting onto what I'm saying right now. You know, all that smarmy, sarcastic, sneering, pseudo detached Freudianism, you know. It's like social Darwinism dressed up as compassion, you know? It's, it's, that's what I think about it, you know? As Dylan again, going back to it, sometimes Satan comes as a man of peace. Sometimes Satan comes as a man of peace. Sometimes Satan comes as a man of peace. I don't know. 
so that that that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, but I but I'm just you know I think I think that the best you can do as an artist these days is to just ignore it, ignore the noise, ignore it. But uh, as Christopher Hitchens used to say, the, sometimes, and this is true irony, not sarcasm. This is true irony. It's an example of true irony. But he would say that actually, with the you know, in 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 totalitarian regimes, the most effective revolution is is an ironic revolution where you act as if, quote unquote, the regime wasn't there. So I think that the best thing for an artist to do is to act as if there is no Twitter mob, act as if social media isn't the dominant structure of our culture now, to act as if there is no physical repercussions for, for, for thinking the unthinkable or saying the unsayable, and to act as if political correctness doesn't exist, to act as if we don't live in a hippie dictatorship, as Brendan O'Neill called it. <coughs> Brendan O'Neill's good, I mean, actually, there's a, there's a great clip of Brendan O'Neill talking about exactly this online, the hippie dictatorship. Um, and I did actually print out the, the thing of what he said in total. Uh, and maybe I can read it out. Um, yeah, I'll read it out and then I'll just, I'll give some commentary on it because I think it is actually quite interesting. Um, but if you want to just go and listen to him, it's online and I'll put it in the description. I think it's from 2013, but it's become, it's, it's very prescient. Okay, he's, this is him now. Today, it sometimes feels like we're living under a hippie dictatorship. One of the most striking things about Western life in recent years has been the rise of the countercultural outlook, which is now thoroughly mainstream. And one of the most peculiar things has been how authoritarian that countercultural outlook turned out to be, how hostile to free thought and individual autonomy the countercultural sentiment really is. I mean, I, is, where I come from on this is, is not quite agreeing with Brendan O'Neill here. I think he's right to say that it's authoritarian, but I think that it's not the same counterculture as it originated as. That's, that, that's become authoritarian, and I think that's the key for me. I want to try and figure out what happened between what was once a very free-spirited movement, as he goes on to say, but there was a change, there was a shift. It's not something intrinsic to the countercultural movement. I still believe in the counterculture of the 60s and 50s, actually, and the beats. I'm a beat poet. That's where I come out of. I'm a beat poet, you know? My ideal time is 1957, 1958 in a, in a coffee shop in Greenwich Village. That's my ideal time. <laughs> okay, if I could go back to any time, that would be it. Where the counterculture was a general emancipation of the individual in the face of sort of uh, industrialization and uh, the military industrial complex and, and um, the sort of propaganda of consumerism that was emerging, that there was this reaction to it. But the reaction was on the basis of the individual, of emancipating freedom of the self, freedom of the freedom of agency from oppressive forces. It's easy to look at the hippies and be dismissive, but they were really reacting. You understand it once you see how stale, and it was it's just like the Victorians. It was this very stale, stultifying pressure. Unfortunately, he, Brendan O'Neill was right. They've become the new counterculture. He goes on. All the once countercultural trends that are now deeply embedded in everyday society, from, environmentalist, from the environmentalist ethos to feminist thinking to the therapeutic self-exploring urge, have proven to be quite censorious and suffocating of autonomy, autonomy rather than liberating. The beatniks and hi hippies and bra burners of the 1960s and 70s were outwardly anti-authoritarian. Exactly outwardly free-spirited, yet their political legacy is one of stricture, new orthodoxies, a climate of control and individual submission to the new mores. Right, and I, I wrote something down here. It's, it, it reminded me of that quote from Orwell where he said, you know, to, there's no point in, it's something like, let me find it. Something like, 
There's no point in replacing one orthodoxy with another, effectively. Let me see if I can find There's a quote here from her. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. So yeah, but he has another quote. But that is a good quote. But he has another quote where he's saying just replacing one orthodoxy with another is just the same thing. But that's why that quote exemplifies it. It's like to have just another orthodoxy, no matter how, this is what political correctness is, it becomes an orthodoxy. It's automatic thinking, just like he's saying, you don't need to think. And that's what I'm against about political correctness. It's, it doesn't matter to me. You could be, you could be, you know, Gandhi, but if you're telling me what to think rather than allowing me to think for myself, then you are my enemy. Period. Period. <clears throat> And that's what's happened to the counterculture for some reason. But it's so weird because it seemed to me that, say, someone, someone like the counterculture, uh, someone who embodies the counterculture to me is someone like Jim Morrison. And Jim Morrison was very much, it was just, it was so much about think for yourself. Think for yourself. Don't give in to orthodoxies. Don't give in to things that do the thinking for you. Anyway, we'll go back to Brendan O'Neill. How did this happen? How did the apparently freewheeling, spliff-smoking counterculture of the 1950s give rise to the soul-destroying environmentalism of speech-policing feminism of today? How did the outlook of those tradition-trampling outsiders become so insider and also so fundamentally killjoy? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. It's always just fun policing, isn't it, eventually? Grizzled old hippies love to say that if you can remember the 1960s, then you weren't really there. But sadly, even those of us who can, can't remember them on account of the fact that we weren't born are living with the consequences of the 1960s. Again, I'm not so sure it's so clear as that. I don't think we're living with the consequences of the 1960s as in it was inevitable. But I think that somewhere along the line, the idea of the sort of reformation, the cultural reformation got twisted. That's the way I look at it. or rather the consequences of the countercultural politics that emerged in that decade, which, and which largely by default, have become the dominant politics of the modern era. The success of the countercultural outlook has been extraordinary. Ideas which just a couple of generations ago were edgy, held only by middle class, enlightened youth, and rejected by the man, are now organizational, organizing principles of modern society. Most strikingly, environmentalism, the concern with man's polluting hubris and his rampaging desire for stuff, has gone from being a fringe whinge of long-winded nature lovers to being the most valuable political currency of the age. Every government on earth now pays at least lip service to the need to protect nature from mankind's most more brutal instincts for exploration and exploitation. Now, I think there's a subtext here, which, again, I don't agree with Brendan O'Neill uh, because I know that he's a very sceptical about climate change or sceptical about man-made man climate change being as much of a problem as most people think it is. I tend to fall on, in line with most of the left on that, personally, but... Anyway, I think it's, 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 it's worth noting that he's a skeptic anyway. International bodies, but he's right about the sort of, the, the, again, it's, it doesn't matter how right you are. It doesn't matter how moral your position might be. If this, the, 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 up, the, the upshot of it is that I am being told what to think rather than being allowed to think, then it's wrong, categorically. It doesn't matter. You could be, you could be calling for love and peace. But that too can be an ideology because it's, it subverts my ability to come to that point of view on my own. And that was what the Enlightenment was about. It was the belief that at least people were capable of coming to the right conclusions on their own terms if they were given all the right tools and weren't pathologized by society. And that to me is true leftist thinking. That to me is Thomas Paine's thinking. <sighs> Virtually every school child in the Western world is educated to live, think, and act greenly, which is to say, meekly. Yeah, I think that that's true. I think that um, it's al it, it always is, it gets used to, in order to reduce people in some way, to make you feel guilty, is like, you know, as if this, you know, that there's this original sin in humanity that causes us to kill the environment and therefore we have to hold ourselves back. There's some 
something insidious about that. Feminism, too, has moved from the streets and the occupied lecture halls of radicalized universities into the heart of social policy making, and, and not only in a good way, in the sense of having equal pay policies or childcare provision, but in a bad way, too. The feminist ethos is now often used by figures of authority to denounce allegedly masculine values such as self-reliance, individualism, a preference for victory over consensus. Indeed, feminism has been turned into something of a battery. And that's a good point he makes there, because every time I say, oh, I feel that modern feminism is quite anti-male, they go, oh, give me an example, give me an example. But the thing is, is they're very subtle examples. It's, it's not that men are a direct... Often, no, sometimes they are, but not often it's not so much that men are a direct enemy or stated enemy of feminism, but it's, it's certain things which go, which are intrinsic to being male, um, competitiveness being an example, or a certain amount of um, aggression. These things are attacked and dismissed and denounced to the point where men in, will inevitably, and I've grown up, just grow up feeling like that. I've done that. I had that, and I couldn't realize why. Because no one actually said, you're a man, therefore you're bad. No one ever actually said that. But everything I hold, everything that my instincts was telling me uh, was good about myself and, 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 you know, this sort of self-assertive part of being a man was bad. And so therefore you just come to the conclusion that, it, that having a fucking penis is bad. And that's someone, and, I, and I've grown up with that and I think it... it I think, it, you know, it, it might, there might have been a time where it needed to be reined in, for sure. But it's now gone the opposite way, where it's just, you know, totally gone the opposite way. And he talks about this. Indeed, feminism has been turned into something of a battering ram against the testy clash of ideas that was once the lifeblood of politics by campaigners who say we need more feminized style of political life. As one expert says of Britain's House of Commons, its yabu culture is finally being undercut by the arrival of more women MPs who introduce a kinder, gentler politics characterized by cooperation rather than conflict because women are less adversarial and better team players. Yeah, that just speaks, uh, to me that, that speaks to the point I'm, I was saying earlier, that there's a subtle subversion of anything masculine. It's, it's fine that I think we did need the feminist revolution because we needed to counterbalance it, absolutely. That it was the, the very the very kind of masculine authoritarianism that sent Oscar Wilde to jail is exactly the, I agree with that and I think that we've we've largely fought against that through feminism so I feel very lucky to have, to have lived with the benefits of of the first or second wave feminism but this but there's this it's it's gone so far now that itself has become an orthodoxy and it's become something you can't question to the point where you as a man you automatically feel guilty just for existing. This strikes me as not only threatening the, to the practice of politics, which ought to be about fiery conflict and clashing visions, but also extremely patronizing to women. The depiction of women as kind, gentle souls takes us back, ironically, to a pre-60s outlook, and yet its depiction of frequently promoted, promoted by modern feminists themselves against the caricature, caricature of, bad of the bad, swaggering man with his apparently problematic principles and convictions. Sorry, I didn't read that sentence right. Let me just go back to it. The depiction of women as kind, gentle souls takes us back, ironically, to the pre-60s outlook, and yet its depiction, it's a depiction frequently promoted by feminists themselves against the caricature of the bad, swaggering man with his apparently problematic principles and convictions. And he, goes he goes off on, on more about feminism and censorship and that sort of thing there, but it's not really to the point of what I'm saying, but... Yeah, he talks again about, yeah, so he gets down to it here. I'll read this. The therapeutic trend of the 1960s counterculture and the tendency to spend more time staring at one's own navel than observing the world is also, is also now everywhere, from Oprah's couch to the covers of the myriad celeb magazines. People are letting it all hang out in a way that was one, once hippies did, while the rest of the society winced with embarrassment. Yeah, so basically, and he goes on to, to quote a couple of, social critics, basically saying that <coughs> the problem with the counterculture is that it was kind of vapid and really just effectively obsessed with style, lifestyle, uh, self, self-obsession. Um, so the, the, there's a the kind of uh, ideology of, 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 of therapy. Um, 
as and, and the ideology of uh, narcissism rather than individual empowerment. So there's a difference between being selfish and being individualist. If you're an individualist, you basically say, well, you know, what Mill and Orwell were talking about, that people should be able to think for themselves, that, that people should be not told what to think. Uh, but but he's saying that basically the counterculture was really always just uh, a sort of um, inferior orthodoxy in and of itself, because it was it was based around self empowerment rather than individual empowerment, and the subtle difference there being that actually the reason why authority he's basically what where he goes with it is that the authoritarianism emerges from the fact that the picture of the human self that emerges from the counterculture is very small, weak. You know, that there are all these social forces that we're constantly being oppressed and there's nothing we can do about it so that we need pampering and taking care of and we need the state to, 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 to help us. Whereas the sort of traditional individualist million view is much more that we have we that if we give the if we give a child the right education and the right kind of family structure and the and the right and we create a society of opportunity and free thinking then we create then we give we give individuals everything they need to forge their own integrity and that will create a flourishing society um, and it's not to say that there won't be deviants, there won't be problems, there won't be murderers or killers or, or, or psychopaths, or, but, but the dominant normal, normality of society will be one of individual flourishing. And, and, and whatever we try, and whatever society, in whatever sort of forces of, the, of restraint that exist in society are really there to create that flourishing. So they are in service of freedom. That's liberty, that the, the restraints and the chains that society creates around itself are really there for the individual flourishing, to protect it in some way from pathology or, or deviancy or, 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 that, or the kind of suffering intrinsic to human life. So, but that, that con contrasts with the, with the emergent view from the counterculture, which was once so anti-authoritarian, was that we're fragile, we're fragile selves, and so the, the whole debate around free speech is a good example of that now, I guess. That the picture from the left about what we are is so fragile and, um, you know, the, the, the idea that being just simply exposed to hateful views, we will all suddenly turn into Nazi Germany overnight. You know, that's a very paranoid view of human life. And also a very simplistic view of what happened in places like Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, which was a moral breakdown over a long period of time and, and the result of many different forces and many different kinds of propaganda. So to, to simply say that just simply being exposed to hateful views turns you into a hateful person is a very impoverished view of the self and a very disempowering one. And in that sense, I agree with it. I agree with what he's saying, that the, 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 the current state of the counterculture is such that it promotes a very feeble, fragile version of the of the self. And I guess that, that, that sort of explains a lot of the rise of the, the alt-right movement because they're, they're really trying to go back to an individualist view. Maybe they're going too far. But it, put, it puts things in perspective. But where I'll disagree with it is I think that it's not intrinsic. I don't think that... It certainly wasn't intrinsic to George Orwell or to Thomas Paine or to Woody Guthrie or even to Karl Marx. You know, the, 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 the view of the self that was put forward by those guys was a very powerful view. And, um, but something, something along the, something's gone wrong along the line uh, with the countercultural movement. And, and, and Brendan O'Neill, you know, he, is, he would consider himself part of the counterculture, you know, uh, in the real sense. Um, he's the editor of Spiked, which I've been published in, and I'm proud to have been published in. But he, is, at the end of this, he does go on to say, I'm not going to read the whole thing out, because basically he quotes a lot of people. That, I know, that, you know, there's, there's, it's just kind of boring for me to just read things out. But um, Yeah, the, I, I'm not so sure I, di I agree with, with the, the exactly with his diagnosis, because the diagnosis... It seems to diagnose something intrinsically pathological with the counterculture itself, but 
you know, if you think about people like Kerouac or Ginsburg, or you know, they were maybe there there were there were, so people like I I just have problems with Burroughs who said all language is a virus and things like that. So the, there was this sort of fatalism, I think, in some parts of the counterculture, which created this impoverished view of the self that basically we're fucked, that there's so many forces oppressing us, that the, the system's rigged so much against us, that we're so fragile and incapable of fighting back against it. But I think that the, the big culprit here is the consumerist agenda, which, which uh, hijacked counterculture. And, and basically, that, that, that consumerist agenda is very much tied up with the sort of Silicon Valley technology culture that we live in now, which is we are fragile, but if we have technology, we can hack that fragility in some way. And you know, I, I think that there, was some, there, was, there possibly were some things always in, 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 in the countercultural movement from the 60s and the, or the 50s that, that had this fatalism, but I think there was so much about the counterculture that's salvageable and that needs to be uh, rejuvenated in the face of this, and, and is, and is in intrinsically anti-authoritarian in the, in the sort of million sense that, it, that whatever, whatever systems and institutions and restrictions might have to exist in society, they are there in service of freedom and flourishing of individual conscience and the eradication of automatic thinking, the eradication of orthodoxy, which is exact, and, 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 and propaganda and manipulation, which is what Orwell was talking about. And, and that, to me, is true leftist thinking. And somewhere along the line, it's become associated with authoritarianism, which I don't think it always was. And, and certainly the Bohemian Revolution was not. It, that wasn't particularly leftist. It, you know, there's a lot of small C conservatism in the Bohemian movements. You know, the idea of a sort of conservation and 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 and, and taking you know taking care of your own world and this, this sort of yeah, a kind of conservationism was intrinsic to Bohemianism and a very individualistic view, which is now nowadays thought of as right wing. So, but it. It was counterculture, and the counterculture, true counterculture, is about the emancipation of the individual, the, 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 the flourishing of the individual and creating a better society in which more and more and more people can live independently and live as free thinkers and flourish on their own terms, and by doing so, creating this knock-on effect in society where society improves and progresses naturally from that flourishing of individuality. And, but Brendan O'Neill is right. The counterculture has become oppressive. It's become self-obsessed. It's be it's be it's it's become an ideology of a very narrow, paranoid view of the self, neurotic view of the self. And we need a new counterculture which goes against that, which affirms a stronger, more robust, and thrilling and exciting view of human potential. Because so much of the counterculture is very cynical and nihilistic now. It's, it's that we're, we're all fucked, we're all being screwed. It's paranoid, you know? It's, it's completely paranoid. And I guess I've contributed to that in some way, you know? And I, I used to believe in all that. Um, and I used to have that kind of paranoia. But I think that if we can eradicate that paranoia, we can get over it. <laughs> anyway, I really have to go. But um, <coughs> thanks for listening. And. Um, this was episode 56. Um, I'm busking at least twice a week now in Vauxhall, so uh, uh, usually on Sundays and Wednesday nights. So if you've got nothing else to do and you want to come down and listen to some tunes, I usually busk in and around the station at Vauxhall in London. Um, I'll also be putting up... I've got, I do book reviews, so if you go to unacknowledgedlegislation.com, there's a recent review I did of Jordan B. Peterson's book, and uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be here next week. So uh, thanks for listening. And yeah, I'll speak to you then. Cheers. <laughs>